Hello, and welcome to the Week 2 Supplemental Lecture, Agnes Heller's Three Logics of Modernity and the Double Bind of the Modern Imagination. This is probably the most difficult reading choice that we have this week, not because the ideas are exceptionally complex compared to some of the other readings, but because of the way that it's written. It starts off extremely abstractly, it presupposes a lot of heavy philosophical background, and it doesn't get around until the very, very end to stating explicitly what the stakes are. So what I want to do in leading you through the article is to talk about what those stakes are going to be more up front, and then we'll walk through the structure of the piece and try to give you a feel for how the argument itself is made. So the piece starts, and it's asking questions about what are the characteristics of modernity, as most of the other readings this week have been doing as well. The thing that is worrying Heller is why you get something that seems to have so much promise, and this is a concern for a lot of theorists who are writing out of the experience of the mid-20th century, of fascism, of the Holocaust, and then of the Cold War and the Soviet Union. Why is it that you have this period of history that seems to be so bound together with notions of freedom, and yet it generates such catastrophes? And Heller herself has had personal biographical experience both with the Holocaust, she and her mother escape, but her father does not, um, and then having to flee Hungary uh, as there's a crackdown there on the kind of intellectual work she's doing, and she flees to Australia. So she's had quite personal experiences that lead her to be concerned about what is it about this period of history that we're living in that seems to hold so much promise and yet results in such horrific and oppressive institutions. Is there some way that we can understand that? This is a driving problem for many, many theorists of her generation. So she says modernity is founded on freedom. Okay, it emerged from the destruction of a foundation. It attacked traditional foundations, received and inherited foundations. But it itself has no foundations. It is founded on this attack. It is a world, she says, that continuously has to reinvent itself. And this is what she means by freedom here at this point in the piece. She's not so much talking about freedom at the individual level as she is talking about the time and the way that it tears its own foundations down. She says there's a dynamic of modernity that is something that is not specific to a particular historical period. So you can get a dynamic of modernity in classical Greek antiquity. But the modern historical period has been particularly characterized by this dynamic. And the dynamic involves a constant interrogation of inherited traditional concepts of what is true, what is good, and what is just. There's no intrinsic boundaries or stopping points to this interrogation, so it can keep going to the point that it undermines the legitimacy of any existing social institution. And so the consequence, she says, is that modernity can be understood as an ongoing process of negation. And she's not the only person this week or the only person this term that we'll run into that uses this term okay, for modernity, that it constant process of negation. It does not have positive content other than through the criticism of what already exists. That's what drives it forward. And then she talks about the modern social arrangement. And she says that this process of negation that's characteristic of modernity attacks social hierarchies that are understood to be founded in human nature. It perceives these kinds of social hierarchies to be artificial. And this involves a new conception of nature where nature itself is understood not to have any particular inequality other than things that might result from sort of random distribution of skills, but there are artificial inequalities imposed by society, and so there's an attempt to reconfigure society so that it is in conformity with this perceived natural equality. She talks about the paradox of freedom, and she's again one of a number of political theorists that will think this way, that there's something strange in our foundation being itself something that is corrosive, that is mobile, that is fluid. So it's a non-founding foundation. It's, a, it's a, an incessantly moving point to try to ground a society on. It's a ground that's not a ground. And then she says she wants to look at two imaginations 
One is what she calls a technological imagination associated with the technical enlightenment that focuses on truth and science and technology. And the other is a historical imagination associated with something she calls the romantic enlightenment that is associated or concerned with meaning, interpretive works, and hermeneutics. And she thinks that both of these imaginations run through modernity and that they're expressed to greater or lesser extents in different aspects of modernity. Now again, this sounds extremely abstract, but what she's engaging with here is a body of critical literature, some of which we'll read in several weeks' time, that is grappling with the Holocaust as the industrially produced genocide of a people, and that is trying to understand what the drivers of that might be. And one of the bodies of theory that she's engaging with thinks that it is essentially driven by technology, that this is the culmination of technology, technology that at one point in human history had seemed to hold such promise for freedom. Uh, a lot of the communist ideal is built on the idea that technology, by taking care of the issue of material wealth, will give us enormous leisure and freedom. And it's a real shock to a particular category of political and social theory when you get technology used for the industrialized bloodshed of both the Holocaust and the World Wars. And there is a reconsideration of the notion of technological progress and a questioning of whether that notion always had within it from the beginning something horrible. She's more ambivalent. Um, she doesn't think that this is an adequate explanation by itself for the Holocaust. She wants to look at both technological and historical imaginations and how they work together, how they cooperate with one another to possibly cause horrific historical outcomes and then how we can prevent that. So in looking at these two imaginations, she also says she's going to look at three logics. And what she means by logic is something that in more everyday language we might talk about as a developmental tendency or a trend. These are trends, these are things that happen within modern societies. And she wants to look in each of these trends and see whether we can see the technological or the historical logic being more dominant and whether both of them have a role to play or only one. So that's the structure of the argument and what she's going to do in this paper. So the logic of the technology is probably the thing she talks about that will remain the most familiar to contemporary ears. So it's future-oriented, it's problem-solving, it's associated with something she calls a correspondence theory of truth. So, you know, something out there in the world, uh, our, I, do our ideas correspond to it? They're right because they correspond to what's out there in the world. Um, she uses various phrases for what some of the other theorists we're going to read this term will call instrumental rationality. So reason that is directed toward the best means to achieve a particular end, but it is not given, the end is not given by instrumental rationality itself, so the end is set outside the process. This is a concept that gets a lot of attention around issues like the Holocaust, because there is a rational, systematic, orderly implementation of a horrific goal. And so the idea that there's something about the logic of technology that enables people to focus in a quite rational way on implementing horrific outcomes. Okay, so the distinction between instrumental rationality and a more substantive or ends-oriented rationality that would let us rule out horrific goals becomes a preoccupation of a certain category of theory. The logic of technology treats both human and non-human entities as objects. It expresses or embodies a faith in progress and the growth of knowledge. It prefers new to old. It privileges utility and efficiency. And it has a disproportionate impact on the other trends that she's going to analyze. So where the other trends have some impact on the logic of technology, the logic of technology, this particular developmental tendency, is really a dominant tendency in modernity. And as you'd guess from what it's called, it is also disproportionately something that embodies the technological imagination. She finds small spaces for historical imagination in technological development, mainly around scientific revolutions. What she has in mind will be a little bit clearer when we take a look at Kuhn in a few weeks.
but she says the development of technology and its rationality is now empirically universal. It is in fact the same all over the world. And she's very curious whether there's anything other than technology that has any possibility of having that same empirical rationality. Is it possible to have social institutions of some other sort that might have that kind of empirical rationality where they might spread around the world and provide the basis for a kind of practical universalism? And she's not sure. Then she's got this very awkward phrase, the logic of functional allocation of social positions. And she's combining a few different things here. One is what might normally be called the division of labor. And next week we'll take a look at some classical authors who are very preoccupied with the division of labor. It's something of interest. Because one of the things that happens with the development of capitalist society is an enormous proliferation of the division of labor. So that's some of what she's out here, but it's not everything. She's also got in mind social movements that are contesting the allocation of social roles, the distribution of social wealth, and issues of justice. Okay, and so you have these social contestations, and there's a body of theory that's interested in how these contestations are affected by the rise of the welfare state, which is a phenomenon that we'll look at somewhat late in the term. The way in which you get social mobilizations that are trying to influence the allocation of social positions and social resources by contestation around this expanded state that is providing social goods. And she says, unlike the technological logic, which is sort of linear and builds and accumulates over time, this isn't linear at all. It's not unidirectional. You can have someone pushing in one direction successfully, and then another group will push back in the other direction. So it doesn't drive history in any particular way, but you can identify it as a developmental tendency that you will have this back and forth movement, that you will have these contestations and they'll impact on institutions predictably, but the direction of that impact is not predictable. And she says that these contestations are often guided by the historical imagination and its insights, but they have a complex interaction with the technological imagination which affects the sorts of things that are available to allocate and how that allocation may be able to play out. There is a tendency in some of the theory that she's got in mind that she's critical of to talk about the division of labor and the specialization of skills as a technological phenomenon and therefore to view the specialization negatively as the development of these sort of expert cultures. She says, however, that sort of specialization is necessary, it is a prerequisite for the development of a more general culture in which the historical imagination plays a larger role. So she thinks that there's a more complicated interaction of the two imaginations in this dimension of modernity. And then she talks about the logic of political power, and here's where she writes at slightly greater length about this than the other. She seems to struggle with it more. She says it's more complicated to work out the impacts of historical and technological imaginations here. Both of them don't really seem exactly right. Technological imagination doesn't look like the sort of thing that you would use for constitution building. It might get you some very ideal, schematic kind of constitution, but nothing that could really be implemented in a useful way. She says historical imagination doesn't seem to apply either, because the goal of constitution building is to found something new. It's a strange discussion of political power here because it does focus so much on constitution building, which in the context of much political theory is only a small element of the political. Um, but she's interested in it here, presumably because of the degree to which constitution building is a sort of a unique, unusual feature of the modern period. And again, she raises the issue of how the technological imagination and the developmental tendencies associated with technology are so clearly empirically global and universal. And she says it's difficult to imagine how this would ever apply to political institutions and constitutions. You do get the spread of constitutional ideas, but she says they tend to arise very, very uniquely in specific countries or specific areas in very particular circumstances. And when they spread, they're adapted to highly local conditions. 
So she doesn't really think there's a kind of universalizing power behind constitution building that you can see in the realm of technology. Now, it'll be interesting, we'll take a look at some later pieces, uh, a bit later in the course, that would contest this and that do in fact think that there has been a universalization of particular kinds of political institutions just in very, very recent history. And that's a contested point, but certainly the position she's outlining here is itself also contested. And then she says, historical imagination is active in ideology. And ideology, as she uses it here, isn't solely a negative term. It's not something to be avoided. She says, ideology is necessary. But the other thing that's necessary with ideology is its ongoing critique. So ideology brings things together, it makes things cohere, but if it does that too well, you get frightening forms of, oppress of oppressive political power. So she wants a use of ideology that binds people together, but that can be shot through with critique that prevents it from having oppressive consequences. And then she talks about the double bind. And here's finally where the stakes become explicit to someone who might not already be familiar with the debate she's engaging with. She says you need both imaginations, the technological and the historical, a problem-solving orientation to the future and a meaning-giving orientation to the past. But if you expand either one of those in a one-sided way, it leads to a totalization that's destructive of freedom. And she thinks this is true of both of them. She thinks that it's marginally more true of the technological imagination than the historical imagination, and she talks particularly about the technological imagination's capacity to drive things towards some kind of ecological crisis. But she's not willing to say that the technological imagination or the historical imagination by themselves generated the Holocaust. She thinks it's a product of both, and this introduces a new risk. It's a risk that these two imaginations, rather than existing in tension with each other and pulling in different directions, when they align, she thinks you've got a very, very dangerous situation. So she views the Holocaust as arising from an alignment of a technological imagination and a historical imagination, where the historical imagination directed the technology toward an end, an exterminating end, that the technological imagination itself wouldn't necessarily have chosen. And then the technological imagination carried out that end with a horrific ruthlessness. So what she wants are forms of political institution, forms of social institution, that will keep these two things in tension with each other, which is a space where she believes there's room for freedom. So she says, problem solving and interpretation, planning and recollection, calculation and thinking, reflection or unthinking madness. The danger of totalitarianism looms large whenever the two binds are united and point in one direction. Liberalism and democracy, if joined together, can offer, perhaps, spaces in which they can coexist in tension. This is not a goal to be achieved, but a practice to be kept alive. You get lots of interesting things there that we'll unpack in subsequent weeks. Notice the distinction between liberalism and democracy, which is a distinction that sometimes gets blurred in the tendency to talk about liberal democracy. These are, in fact, very different institutions, where democracy is focusing on forms of majority rule or forms of joint participation in collective governmental decision-making. And liberalism is focusing on the division of institutions to provide checks and balances so that no one institution becomes dominant, so that no one body of people becomes dominant. And liberalism is often particularly worried about the domination of a majority over an unpopular minority. And we'll take a look at some of those topics next week. <laughs>